go ahead and start. Um, this is a topic that I think is incredibly important, not just for hair health, but for total body health, but obviously we're gonna focus on hair this evening. Um, it's we've got a lot of information in here, just a few logistics. Uh, if you have questions, because we will hopefully have time for question and answers at the end, the question and answer, the questions go into the Q&A section, not the chat. So don't um, put anything in the chat. Um, um, tonight I am joined by Kim, Kim Frislak, who is our nurse practitioner and director of clinical services in our New York offices, both in Sparsdale and Manhattan. Happy to have her join us today. Thank you, Kim. Um, so um, anyway, this is this is a very timely topic. Um, I think stress has played a huge role in our lives over the last three to four years, and the effects that it has had on our physical and emotional well-being has been quite profound. We've seen that here in many trusts um, with hair, which is, you know, you wouldn't think that would make that much difference, but it has. Um, so that's really why I wanted to talk about it. Um, so let's get started. Bear with me. Um, Kim and I will come back at the end um, when it's time for question and answers, but for now we're going to uh, remove ourselves from the photo so that you have more um, space to see us. Okay. All right. Again, hello, welcome. I'm Dr. Mary Wendell. I'm the National Medical Director of MediTress. Um, and Kim Prislak is with me tonight. Again, the Director of Clinical Services for our New York offices. Um, I hate these disclaimers, but we need to mention it. Um, again, we're not here to treat you uh, via video. We're here to give you information only. Um, only a licensed medical professional can really diagnose and, and treat your problems. Um, so again, that message will be said over and over again. If you feel you need help, you need to see a specialist and uh, we can help you with that. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about tonight? We're gonna talk about stress. Uh, Short-term stress, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but chronic stress, long-term stress, is uh, fairly negative effects on the body. We'll talk about those. And then Kim will talk mostly about the types of hair loss affected by stress. How does it happen? What does it look like? Um, what's medical treatments for it? And at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about behavior modification and lifestyle changes. And, and do they make a difference? Do they help? And I feel strongly that they do. And um, I'll share with you some of the things that I do and its limitations as well as, as its benefits. Um, a little bit of education, which I think is important to know what these terms mean because they've come up in our discussion this evening. Um, and those of you who have joined us before, this is old news for you, but it's always a nice review, even for me. Um, so the hair life cycle has three phases primarily. The antigen phase is the growth phase, and that can last anywhere from two to six years. As we get older, women in my age group and beyond, our hair tends to grow um, not nearly as long. Uh, my granddaughters have hair all the way down their backs, but my hair will never grow that long because the growth phase shortens over time as you get older. The catagen phase is sort of the transition phase. It's the resting phase um, where the hair is getting ready to shed. And that's the telogen phase where the hair actually comes out, the follicle doesn't grow anything. And that resting phase can last anywhere from three to four months. There are certain medical problems where it can last a bit longer, um, but on average it's three to four months. All right, the types of female hair loss, again, if you joined us before, this is not new, but again, it's a good review and these terms are going to come up again this evening. There's two types of hair loss in women. There's called non-scarring um, and then scarring. The non-scarring alopecia is hair loss that can regrow if treated um, appropriately and diagnosed early enough. And these include androgenic alopecia, which is the most common type, the female pattern hair loss. Telogen effluvium is something you hear a lot about. It's excessive shedding, oftentimes associated with stress. Traction alopecia is hair loss due to excessive pulling. Um, that can cause permanent hair loss if it goes on for too long. Um, alopecia areata is an uh, autoimmune disease that uh, causes a lot of hair loss. It can be involve the entire scalp or just patchy circles of loss. Um, 
again, aggravated, can be aggravated by stress. And then the last group of non-scarring alopecia is post-cancer hair loss. The scarring alopecias are inflammatory and they're conditions that can then destroy the hair follicle, causing scarring and permanent loss. And these are the three most common. There are others as well, but these are the ones that we see primarily here at Meditrust, the frontal fibrosing, central centripetal cicatricial alopecia, that's a mouthful, and the lichen planopal loss. They're sort of similar. There's a lot of overlap there. All right, treating female hair loss. Uh, the first step, I don't, doesn't matter what the diagnosis is, um, the first step is really getting a good, thorough uh, medical evaluation. There are a lot of spas out there trying to treat hair loss, but unless you get a, the proper diagnosis, you're not going to get the proper treatment. And to get the proper diagnosis, you need a good medical history, a hair loss history, a thorough physical examination, including trichoscopy, which is the magnifying light where we can look at your scalp and the hair follicles, and then sometimes blood work and less frequently biopsy. The treatment plan can vary significantly um, depending on the diagnosis. So it's not one treatment fits all by any means. All right, I'm going to turn this over. Oh, not yet. Um, I just wanna talk about stress just generally. Um, this picture is very dramatic and um, a bit troublesome to be honest, but the World Health Organization defines stress as follows. Stress can be defined as a state of worry or mental tension caused by a difficult situation. Stress is a natural human response that prompts us to address challenges and threats in our lives. Everybody, everyone experiences stress to some degree. The way we respond to stress, however, makes a big difference to our overall well-being. And this woman clearly is under a great deal of stress. Um, she's shedding a lot of hair, and now she's had that added stress of losing her hair and worrying about that. So there's short-term stress. Um, our bodies produce hormones, steroid hormones called glucocorticoids, which actually help the body adjust to potentially harmful changes. Um, whether it's illness or physical stress or emotional stress, our body has the way, way of reacting to it. It mobilizes white blood cells, it changes our immune system, changes us biochemically. In humans, that specific hormone is called cortisol, which we know does increase during times of stress. All of this is good because it helps decrease the inflammation short term and helps us respond to the stress. The problem lies when it becomes chronic stress. During periods of long-term chronic stress, these persistently elevated levels of cortisol can lead to impaired anti-inflammatory effects of the immune system. This can lead to chronic infections, chronic inflammatory autoimmune diseases, and some hair loss falls into those categories. It may also affect potentially cancers. There's a lot of research going on about that. There's no question that chronic stress and these elevated hormones can affect us biochemically, making us more susceptible to psychological disorders like depression and anxiety. Fortunately, there's a lot of research ongoing to determine all the factors involved, but it's an incredible amount of information that is being produced now. And uh, the research that I did for this webinar was overwhelming for me. Um, it's, 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 I'm hopeful because a lot of research is going on. I think we'll have a better handle on things as we move forward. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Kim. Uh, stress and hair loss. Um, ultimately, the adrenal gland produces cortisol and in turn these triggers the mast cells to degrade in the skin and the hair. And this has been studied. Um, it's called a neurogenic inflammation because it comes from the neuroendocrine system. Um, it is thought that it's the cause of um, the hair to shed. To put it in scientific terms, I like to use simple terms when it comes to teaching my patients, is that when you're stressed and you feel like you're ready to burst, your mast cells are ready to burst. And that kind of makes the assim um, assimilation to our neuroendocrine system. I think when we're talking about cortisol, I definitely uh, cortisol and the elevation of cortisol is what causes stress. Um, I'd like to go back to the beginning in 1936, uh, Dr. Reichman identified the structure of cortisol and overall the, in the same year, Dr. Seeley introduced the concept of stress 
and becoming the father of stress research back in 1936. His experiment showed us um, a lot about how the stress um, cortisol can uh, actually alter the immune system and gut health. Um, and, and it's so interesting because a lot of research has been done in like inflammatory bowel disease where, you know, we associate that with stress. Um, and also now the immune system being affected um, and actually causing, um, you know, hair loss. It's important to understand when we're looking at stress to look at the HPA access. This was actually proposed back in 1950. Um, in the presence of stress, our midbrain or hypothalamus will trigger and release a hormone called CRH, which then tells the pituitary to release ACTH. This is a little scientific, but I, I love the fact that this access works for us all the time. Fight or flight are constantly, our brain is talking to our adrenal glands and, and making cortisol. So yes, there's been definitely a lot of studies showing that both stress um, can cause uh, and worsen several different types of hair loss. Things that we look at in the clinic is excessive shedding, um, which is so important. You know, shedding, when, when a patient in with excessive shedding, it's not like I'm losing a few hairs. It's extreme. I feel like the stress of even the shedding can, can even make the situation worse. Um, it can prolong the resting phase for hair. It can increase inflammation, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. Uh, it can attack and accelerate and de actually destruct the, the uh, hair follicle. Um, and there's another, you know, cause of stress, you know, where we pull our hairs because of the stress and it kind of calms us in ways. And that's called trichotillomania. Um, and also it accelerates the aging and the thinning of the hair loss which I'm gonna show you. There was an article in uh, the uh, Harvard Gazette on the science and technology, which describes uh, the discovery of a molecule that was shown to stimulate the stem cells at the base of the follicle. During these times of stress and uh, chronic stress, elevated cortisol were shown to block the secretion of this molecule and actually thus increasing the loss of, you know, of hair at that time. I think a lot of stress can accelerate hair loss. Some of, you know, even the androgenic hair loss, which I'm gonna talk, talk to you about in the next slide. During stress, there are definitely times of pro-inflammatory states. Um, I think for myself, I learned a lot about stress, particularly physiological stress during COVID. Um, the cytokine storms that we saw, you know, in COVID patients and the amount of stress on the entire body, the inflammatory response was unbelievable. Um, and actually, it's kind of what has led a lot of research into physiological stress, inflammation markers, um, and looking for autoimmune in a lot of these processes. Types of hair loss that we can, uh, you know, plays a role. Research, we've done a lot of research and we know that stress plays a role in, in a lot of hair conditions. Telogen effluvium, alopecia areata, uh, scarring alopecias and others. Uh, it definitely, there's a direct cause and, you know, the neurogenic inflammation appears to contribute to this immune system or dysregulation of the immune system. Telogen effluvium is probably one of the uh, hair loss entities that we see a lot of, particularly in the past three, three to four years. Um, traditionally, we lose about 50 to 100 hairs a day, but this number gets excessive. Um, the hair is released into the telogen phase. It can be sometimes greater than 200, um, sometimes even more. What I feel is that um, it's a global hair loss. In the clinic, we see, you know, patients will come in and they'll see hair everywhere. It's not just in the shower, it's on their pillow, it's in their kitchen. It can be even, you know, on the dinner, you know, the dining room table. And I feel like that's when, it, when that extreme, it, it's scary. And I really feel for a lot of patients who experience this. Um, usually it's a more global loss. Uh, it's not a single area. 
Um, and the, the temple area, since it's thinner to begin with, it seems to get thinner um, more so than the rest uh, you know, the, of the, the scalp. Shedding can take up to six months. Um, and unfortunately, it's really difficult. As long as you have the trigger and we know, you know treating it, uh, it, sometimes it ends a little bit sooner, but it, up to six months is when we can see it. Telogen effluvium, we can see in high stress. I've seen it in a lot of the crash diets, a lot of the, the new uh, weight loss medications on the market. I can see it in thyroid abnormalities, low iron, and changes in hormones and medications. Some of the treatments that we do for T TE um, is, first of all, I think it's more important to make sure you found the trigger. Uh, and in a stressful event, sometimes what happens is we have a stressful event that happens three to six months ago and we forget about it and the hair lags behind. So finding the trigger, making the diagnosis is paramount. Uh, eliminating the stressful events, of course, is, is the most important. Sometimes we, I do use minoxidil because it does prolong that growth phase and helps the hair like basically stick to the scalp. Although this is probably the only time when minoxidil is not like a forever uh, you know, treatment. Um, supplements really work. I think nutritional deficiencies and decreasing stress, counseling, good sleep, diet, stress reduction are so important. Telogen effluvium. Basically, um, postpartum and post-COVID is when we saw a lot. I think I learned the most about stress and hair loss during this time. Uh, and again, it is a very scary time. But one thing uh, is once you fix the trigger, you actually can get full hair return. Trichotillomania. This is an impulsive control disorder where parent, patients actually pull out their hair. Um, this is one time when I really, and I've seen a lot of, you know, this entity with COVID. I felt like the stress of that year and year and a half, two years, um, again, uh, usually they have an underlying uh, or psychiatric issues present, stress, anxiety, um, eating disorders, obsessive compulsive, um, and definitely, you know, we, we've we treated a lot of patients with this. During that time, I felt that uh, getting them the help that they needed was super important. Definitely behavior modification plays a huge role. Uh, stress, stress reduction, uh, particularly, and it's very common in college age young women, uh, where, you know, you're studying and you're just, you know, pulling on your hair constantly in one area. Uh, cognitive therapies, antidepressants and uh, supplements have been noted to help, minoxidil to stimulate new growth. Um, and there is limited studies, but Botox has been used um, to treat these patients. This is fascinating. And there's a few things uh, about COVID that has come up and I've been following it for the past couple of years. Uh, these are two studies that were in uh, two major journals this past month. It's fascinating because we've long appreciated uh, the viral, you know, viral and bacterial infections can trigger autoimmune diseases. Uh, the, these two studies linked, and they were basically very hot, like they were cohort match studies. Uh, looking at patients, 640,000 patients who had COVID uh, with three times that. So it was almost a million and a half people analyzed during this time. What they found was that once you get the virus or bacter uh, bacterial infection, the immune system goes after the virus, attacks it, and attacks these antigens. But the problem is the immune system cross-reacts to other human parts of the body, i.e. the hair. Um, patients who had COVID, three times, uh, I'm sorry, 3% of patients had, and had autoimmune issues such as alopecia areata. Um, there was also a high percentage of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, psoriasis, lupus, and um, inflammatory bowel disease. So the link between physiological stress 
and the immune system. This is what we're learning now um, with our COVID you know, data. And I think there's a big link. I think I feel over the past couple of years, um, alopecia areata uh, has, has numbers have increased dramatically um, in our clinics and in, in, in our office. But I feel that this link between COVID and autoimmune is making us think more about how viruses affect our body. Um, basically, they were saying that about 43% increase in autoimmune issues up to 15 months post COVID. So definitely um, there's a link between autoimmune and the stress or physiological stress in our bodies. Scarring alopecias, definitely uh, we're seeing a, a lot more scarring and I feel that it's definitely autoimmune related, inflammatory related. Um, we're seeing more FFAs, LPP and CCCA. And they, these are patients that most of them have a genetic predisposition. I mean, that's what we're finding now is that, and then it's kind of dormant and then it comes out when it, these autoimmune uh, disorders are triggered. Um, and again, telogen effluvium, you know, being across the board, something we've seen throughout the pandemic. Some of the treatments that we do for scarring, um, definitely it's an inflammatory process. You need to have strong anti-inflammatory treatments. Uh, Cobetazole, topically low-dose naltrexone, uh, low, low, low light laser light therapy has been for me, when it comes to things like TE scarring, or it's a lot of the alopecias that have an inflammatory base, I feel that low laser light therapy is, is paramount. I feel like it's anti-inflammatory over time. It triggers, you know, new growth and um, obviously it has no real side effects. So I think it's really helpful in these patients. Hydroxychloroquine used in a lot of scarring alopecias, particularly immune suppressive. Other treatments that are used, you want to you want to keep that hair in the growth phase. So minoxidil becomes super important. Stress reduction, um, PRP, very very important during these times to give your hair the nutrients that it needs. This is a picture of uh, a patient with LPP. Again, the severe hair loss is seen early. And you know, even though it's scarring, we do get patients back to where they feel really comfortable with their hair. And here's a patient with CCCA. Uh, the before and afters, you know, somewhat dramatic. I think if you get early treatment and you treat them upfront, you can really get a great response. Um, and this is a patient with FFA, which is a more of a frontal fibrosing alopecia. It, as you can see, it usually takes the, the frontal hairline, um, eyebrows. Eyebrow loss is probably one of my first indicators of, of this process going on. But again, you know, getting early treatment is super important. Alopecia areata, I feel that this is up and coming. I've, you know, I've seen so much of it lately. Um, it's an autoimmune disorder leading to patchy hair loss. Um, usually it's demarcated areas. They can start off almost coin-like. Um, unfortunately, you can go into what we call alopecia totalis, which is total loss of hair. Um, there's a very strong emotional component to this. And uh, fortunately, the follicles are not destroyed and recovery can happen. What we do for um, Areata is uh, anti-inflammatories. You can do steroid injections, topical steroids, topical minoxidil, low light laser is very beneficial for its anti-inflammatory components. Um, the JAK inhibitors, which are, you know, new on the market, baricitinib over the past year, um, and definitely stress reduction. And these are a few pictures of a patient with alopecia areata. One of the things um, before I log off, I wanted to, to include in this is hormones. So cortisol is the father hormone of other hormones. 
And that is super important to remember here. But in the perimenopause, in the menopausal woman, this is where I see a lot of, you know, the interaction between your sex hormones, progesterone and estrogen. I've seen stress, emotional stress, physiological stress, put a patient or woman into menopause. And what happens in these circumstances is that the cortisol goes up, your body, you know, your hormones are a symphony. Everyone is playing a part. And unfortunately, uh, usually estrogen, which protects us, can be depleted pretty quickly. What I see in menopausal women with excessive stress is that the cortisol goes up, the estrogen gets depleted, and then they become more androgen dominant. Okay. And as we know in hair, that causes a lot of female pattern hair loss and shedding. And I feel that stress in that woman going through menopause, which is stressful enough, we can see the changes that are occurring. Um, and I feel that that's super important for a woman to remember is that stress, when your hormones are already stressed, it can create a lot of this synchrony in your body. And I, and I think that that's important to note. Um, not only physiological stress, but it definitely emotional stress. And those are the important things to kind of be aware of um, when we're going through those times in our life when it's very stressful. I think being a woman now, you've taken care of your parents, you're taking care of your kids. Uh, we're, we're working multiple jobs and it, all of this is stress, chronic stress. And um, our hormones definitely play a role. And I see it every day in a lot of patients when I'm reviewing their hormonal panels. And I think that we have to look at that as a part of our hair loss. Um, thank you, Kim. I, I think that's actually an excellent point. Um, and one that I actually didn't give a lot of consideration to, but that is an incredible amount of, of emotional stress for a lot of women. And it does play a huge role in androgenic alopecia, which we didn't spend a lot of time on. But there is a lot of scientific uh, research to support that increased emotional stress, increased cortisol will accelerate androgenic, just what most people think about as being female pattern hair loss. And we do know it accelerates around the perimenopausal time. So not only the hormonal physiologic stress, but the, the emotional stress that goes along. And so um, I wanna sort of move on to, you know, what can we do to help modify some of this stress? Um, you know, our, our world is kind of crazy. It's been especially stressful over the last three to four years. Uh, there's a lot going on now um, and, and we all feel it. And so are there things that we can do to try to minimize the effects of this stress on our bodies? And, you know, are there benefits to trying these lifestyle changes to reduce stress? And the answer is yes. And there's a fair amount of science to support this. Okay, I have... A <laughs> I have a, um, a towel in my, a dish towel in my kitchen, which is hanging on my stove and, and literally says, I meditate, I do yoga, I chant, and I still want to smack someone. And the reality is uh, stress is all around us, and, but we still have to work at it. And, and it's not the answer to everything. It needs to be a part of our treatment plan for a lot of these hair loss uh, diseases. So it doesn't mean you don't keep at it. You do have to keep at it. It's something you have to stick with. Um, and there are gonna be times when it's it's gonna be hard, but you need to keep, keep at these lifestyle changes and I'll show you why. Um, this lifestyle changes that we recommend, uh, meditation, yoga, uh, exercise, diet and supplements, sleep and improving social connections. And I'll talk a bit about all of these. Uh, 30 years ago, just here in Massachusetts, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn started the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program at UMass Medical School. Uh, it was incredibly new. Uh, it was an eight to 10 week program. He utilized yoga and meditation to help patients learn to decrease the stress response in their bodies. Um, since then, there have been thousands of studies done to show that these techniques help. They improve the outcomes of some of these treatments. They help the treatments work better. And, and most recently, uh, some of the research 
is beginning to show how and why these treatments uh, work. I was fortunate enough uh, back in the early 90s to take Don's class and to have him as my instructor. And I, you know, wasn't looked highly upon at the time. He was really quite, um, it was quite a new idea. And I remember one evening we were meditating and a bunch of surgical uh, attendings walked in the door and they wanted to use the room. And, you know, John said, well, you know, we're, we're meditating and they, they were very doubtful as to why we were bothering to do it. But um, since then, fortunately, there's been a lot more acceptance and, and a lot more research done to show that it's helpful. Um, a large study published in 2017 in the magazine of Frontiers of Human Neuroscience demonstrated that after a three-month yoga and meditation retreat, the participants had um, improved levels of anti-inflammatory cytokines. Those are those proteins that can be released during times of stress. So the anti-inflammatory cytokines increased. There was a decrease in the pro-inflammatory proteins, the ones that caused inflammation. The cortisol levels uh, leveled off and, and came normalized. One new thing that was found is there was an improved levels of a protein that's called BDNF, which stands for brain-derived neurotropic factor, which to make a long story short, it's a protein that is actually uh, released in the brain that helps our bodies and our brains adjust to changes in our environment, in our lives. So that during times of stress, that protein gets released to help us adjust. It improves the nerve function. It improves the growth factory activity, which is so important in hair growth. It actually also improves long-term memory. So there's a lot of benefits that were found in this study. Also decreased measurements of anxiety. Well, this is lovely, and it shows that under um, the most um, intense three months of yoga and meditation, when they were really separated from the world, this is what can happen. Unfortunately, that's not where we all live, but it just proves that with repeated um, practice that these things can have a significant benefit. What about exercise? Um, so I want to talk about the benefits of exercise from a cardiovascular standpoint, and that's been shown over and over again. Um, but low levels of exercise have been shown to be related to increased measures of inflammation. So it can, and as well as increased levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So low level exercise, sitting on that couch, not doing anything is actually aggravating the inflammation in our bodies and um, can aggravate some of these diseases that we were talking about. Interestingly enough, this same protein, the BDNF protein, was decreased for in, in people who don't exercise very much. So again, that's some protein that is actually needed to help us adjust to change, help us adjust to stress, and those levels decreased when we were inactive. What about diet? Um, diet is something that I feel very strongly about. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why our bodies are responding to stress so so horribly. Um, and what we're seeing so much in terms of hair loss uh, in our clinics over the last you know five to ten years. Um, the Western diet is extremely pro-inflammatory. We know it increases the risk of heart disease, cancer, and it increases the risk of autoimmune diseases. It increases oxidative stress, which means that our our body cells um, basically deteriorate and age prematurely. And the diet also activates inflammatory genes. It alters that gut microbiome that Kim had spoken about. It results in a leaky gut, which increases inflammation. Again, also decreases that BDNF protein. So what do I mean by a Western diet? It's, it's, a, it's a highly processed, high fat diet, uh, with very few fresh fruits and vegetables, a lot of red meat, a lot of fried foods. Those are the diets that are causing inflammation in our bodies. And it's only been getting worse over the last 50 years. Um, I strongly recommend to all of our patients that they try to adhere to an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, there's a something called Dr. Wheel. He's actually a physician in Boston. 
He's very much involved in lifestyle changes and how it improves our health. Um, but we know there's so much inflammation in the hair follicle and so many of these diseases that cause hair loss. And so trying to decrease that inflammation as many ways as possible is incredibly important. Um, what you'll see on this pyramid is there's not a whole lot of meat there. You know, the majority of the diet is, is vegetables and fruits and beans and legumes. And, um, you know, you work your way up and you get a little bit of healthy sweets at the top. But in fact, you know, you can, on his diet, you can eat fish and shellfish. Um, the Blue Zone diet, which some of you may have heard about, there's actually a Netflix documentary series on it. These are areas in the world where people live the longest. And they, they, most of them are vegetarian. They might have a little meat here or there or a little fresh fish. But it basically is the same anti-inflammatory diet that you see on the left here. And, you know, they're, they're researching these individuals who, who eat this diet and trying to figure out what it is. But the biggest thing that they know is that it decreases the inflammation in the body. So anything that we can do to offset that stress, which we know does increase inflammation, Anything we can do to offset that, including exercise, stress reduction, improved diet, all of those things are going to help overall health and improve our hair as well. Um, what about supplements? I will tell you that for many, many years, I rarely encouraged my patients and my medical practice to take supplements, except those people who had been chronically ill were eating poorly, had lost a lot of weight, recently had surgery or a bad infection, those people I would encourage them to. But other than that, I never really felt it was that important. But after doing a fair amount of research on this, the Western diet is extremely deficient in nutrients. Um, the foods that are grown in this country, um, the soil is depleted. There's fewer nutrients, even in the good foods and the fresh fruits and vegetables, there's fewer nutrients in those than there were 50 years ago. During stressful times, we all eat poorly. Um, how many of us after having a hard stressful day, put the kids to bed, have a few minutes, head over to the fridge and grab a, you know, a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. You know, you don't eat regularly, you're not eating as well. So poor nutrition can increase the risk of systemic chronic inflammation. And under stress, we tend to not eat as well. So again, to offset that, you know, I'm, I, I have changed my recommendations in terms of supplements. This one article about chronic inflammation uh, stated, actually stated that the deficiencies in micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, particularly omega-3 fatty acids, impact the resolution phase of inflammation. Meaning that if our nutrition is poor, we're not getting the nutrients that we need, the inflammation that we have is not going to resolve as quickly. So because there's so much underlying inflammation, a lot of it's stress-related, a lot of autoimmune diseases with hair loss. I do recommend supplements now. Um, we did a study a couple of years ago, and these were, these were women with androgenic or female pattern hair loss. We didn't know whether or not they had uh, underlying inflammation. It was really just looking at, at female pattern hair loss. And they weren't undergoing any treatment. And with taking these supplements, uh, prebiotic powder, the fortifier and revitalizer, which are supplements filled with vitamins, minerals, herbal remedies, prebiotics with a lot of anti-inflammatory benefits. After four months of just utilizing these supplements, 100% of the participants had an increase in total hair counts. That's remarkable. And the only thing that I can say is that I believe these women had poor nutrition. Probably a lot of them had some underlying stress. We really didn't get into a lot of that. Although we did have them do a questionnaire at the end, during the study and at the end, and many of them felt that they felt less anxious, less stressed um, after taking the supplements for four months. Oh, sleep. Sleep is one of my favorite uh, topics of discussion. A lot of women, as they go through menopause in particular, sleep poorly. Poor sleep patterns is almost universally a, a part of stress. Um, re research has shown that poor sleep is often associated with increased systemic inflammation, higher levels of those circulating pro-inflammatory cytokines. All of those things are going to cause more inflammation. 
women generally have a higher response to more stressful situations in their bodies. We unfortunately react to it more than men do. Um, I personally think it's because we're under more stress. You know, as Kim mentioned, um, we're caretakers. One of the biggest stresses, um, if you see a list of, of uh, things that cause a lot of stress, you know, caretaking for elderly parents and families way high up there. Um, you know, it's, 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 that's who we are. We are caretakers. Um, women are 41% more likely to experience insomnia and, and how the effects this has on our bodies. Sleep is when our, our body heals. Sleep is when our brain heals. It's when memory becomes a long-term memory. If you don't sleep well, um, those things are lost. There was a study done at Mount Sinai in New York last year. And so people were saying, well, you know, people who are under a lot of stress, who aren't sleeping well, maybe it's, you know, all these other things that are going on in their body that are causing the cytokines to change. And, um, and that, was a, that was a legitimate question and the inflammation to be worse. But what this study did is they took 14 individuals who were felt that they were not under a lot of stress, that were healthy and they were sleeping well. They sleep deprived them by 90 minutes every night for six weeks. They tested their blood before and after the study. They tested them for immune cells. And what they found was after six weeks of less sleep, all of the participants had a significant change in their immune reactions. There were more immune cells, which was a sign of bodily stress. And the biggest surprise was their DNA was altered in these cells. Not only did they have more of them, but the actual genetic makeup of these cells was altered, which is really quite profound and a bit scary. So um, sleep is important in helping us heal. Um, it's hard to get good sleep when you're stressed. That's where a lot of the other um, treatments come in as well. Social isolation is known to increase overall mortality from all causes across the board, not just hair issues, not just autoimmune diseases, but all causes across the board. And we, in the last four years, um, we have been more socially isolated than uh, in probably the previous 30 years or so. How this happens is certainly not completely understood, and it's probably due to many factors, but loneliness and social isolation is known to increase those cortisol levels, which we know can compromise the immune system and increase inflammation and in sensitive individuals aggravate hair thinning. Well, we gave you a lot of information. Um, I'm open to questions there. There's only one question listed at, at the moment. Um, if after you know reviewing this later on, if you, you have some questions um, that we don't get to tonight that weren't thought of this evening, uh, please send them to info at meditrust.com. Um, all of our webinars are put on our uh, website so you can review them later or share them with people you think might get some benefit from it. Um, I will um, try to get myself visible. There I am. Um, so let me let me look at the questions that are that are here. Somebody asked, um, would we be doing PRP and minoxidil? If you're talking about under times of stress, it would depend on what was going on. But the answer is most likely yes. Um, when somebody is aggressively shedding, we don't generally do PRP right at that time, um, but we would um, probably wait until the shedding has quieted down. And if we wanted to accelerate regrowth, PRP would be a choice. Um, somebody asked if we're going to share the recording. Yes, again, it's on it's on um, our, our website. I think it also gets uploaded to YouTube eventually, but I think your best shot is on our website with all the other webinars. Somebody asked, do we recommend a particular type of red laser cap? Um, I will tell you there's a lot of laser therapy out there. Um, not all of it is equal. You want laser treatments that actually have diodes. I know that um, red light is um, some research is being done about having some benefits elsewhere on the body, skin, healing, a lot of different things. But in terms of 
hair regrowth, all the research has been done on laser treatments that actually have laser diodes. And so there's a there's a, a, a fair number. We, we recommend uh, HairMax and the actual laser cap brands because we know the company, they're reliable, they um, will take care of any particular problems that arise and are very, um, again, very reliable. But you don't want to get just an LED light cap. You want to get lasers with diodes. And you have to be careful because um, you don't want just light. The research is on the diodes, the laser diodes. Um, somebody asked about the Harvard article. Um, the, the Harvard article is a preliminary study where they found this protein that actually stimulated hair to grow and found that the cortisol, which is released under times of stress, interfered with that ability, that protein to stimulate growth. That was a preliminary study. They're ongoing. They're actually doing a study on why hair turns gray during times of stress, which is true. I will, I will share with you, my mother was quite ill in her 50s. She went in the hospital with a little bit of gray streaks in her hair, came out of the hospital four months later, totally gray. And it was remarkable. And it was all stress. Um, and they and Harvard, they're doing that, that study. So I don't have any more information about that particular study because it was just a preliminary study and there, it, it is ongoing. But the, what, it, what it stated really was that they could see that the elevated cortisol that occurs under stress actually blocks these proteins which stimulate the stem cells to grow better hair. So it was just one factor uh, of what particular chemical that was getting in the way of hair growth because of stress. Um, another question about types of, um, I assume this is meditation. Um, it doesn't really matter. Um, there are a lot of different types of meditation. Um, um, the most common one is really a mindfulness practice. And you don't have to spend hours at this. I mean, that study where, you know, for three months, these people were isolated and, did, you know, hours worth of meditation and yoga and had all of these biochemical changes is really just an example of what happens um, during these practices. But in real life, uh, most of us can't do that and don't want to. But meditation is just a quieting of the mind and focusing and, and trying to let go of what's going on around you. And it takes practice. And sometimes just starting five or 10 minutes a day and working your way up. Uh, my own practice, I try to meditate every day for about 20 minutes. Sometimes I'll do it twice a day. Um, and that is as effective. And um, there are a lot of apps on, on you can put on download on your phone. There's one in particular called Calm, which has um, is a meditation app. There's 10% Happier, which is another meditation app. Both of those those apps are excellent. Um, there is a fee, a yearly fee to use them, but they have many different meditations. They change. There's a lot of good topics about stress reduction. They do talk about diet, um, other types of healthy benefits to uh, behavior modification. So it doesn't really matter what type of meditation you do, just that you do it. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but yoga initially um, was meant to be a complement to meditation, to allow our bodies to stretch and be comfortable to sit for prolonged periods of time during meditation. Um, it turned into something more. Uh, there are certainly a, a lot of yoga classes that are much more an exercise type class. Um, that's not what it was meant for. The yoga that I do is a meditative yoga. And it truly is a meditation. And again, meditation doesn't have to be sitting still. There can be walking meditations, there can be yoga meditations. But if you just go online and, and see what's out there. Um, but again, the two apps that I, I actually use myself are the Calm, C-A-L-M, and then the 10% Happier your meditation and stress reduction um, apps that you can download on your phone, but not a lot of them. And, and I find them to be very helpful. Um, collagen supplement, that's, that's an interesting topic. Um, there's not a lot of research for collagen supplements and hair loss, but there, I, I found a few when I was doing supplements um, uh, webinar and supplements. The reality is collagen gets broken down into our, in our digestive tract into amino acids, which then get transported and turned into protein. Um, so I think from 
the standpoint of, um, you know, adding amino, amino acids and protein in our body, it may have some benefit. Um, I do think that protein is very important in our diet. Most women need 50 to 60 grams of protein a day. Younger women probably need more. Um, poor nutrition and poor protein intake is one of the most common causes of thin hair. Um, if you watch any models, none of them have very good hair. It's because they don't eat very much. Um, so um, I think supplements in general are helpful. Um, this next question is actually a really good one. Does cortisol make testosterone go up? There's probably an answer to that that I don't know. I'll have to look it up though. Does cortisol make androgenic alopecia worse? And the answer is yes. And again, that study from Harvard and there are many others that show that long-term stress increased um, cortisol does block um, all types of hair loss. So it will make androgenic worse. I will tell you, I will share this with you. Um, the worst case of um, telogen effluvium, which is the shedding that occurs uh, in stress, the very worst case of telogen effluvium I ever saw was in a woman who was probably around 60. And she came in and, and said to me that she had lost half of her hair in about three months. And I have to be honest and say, I'm not sure I totally believed her at the time. Um, her husband came with her and brought photos and said, this was her three months ago. And it was remarkable, the change. And after we did check her for vitamin deficiencies and she was low, a little bit low in her vitamin D and nothing dramatic. And so we did put her on some supplements to help her because she also had been losing some weight from, from her stress. And the reality was her stress was family stress. She was a caretaker for her elderly parents. There was a lot of conflict within the family and it was really affecting her health. And that was obvious because we can see her hair literally falling out into this place. And um, she had to um, learn to share her stress with her family, allow them to step in and help her take care of her elderly parents and, and give up some of the control that she unfortunately had to you know, burden uh, on herself. Um, and when she was able to do that, and when she understood what was, she, what was happening to her, um, her hair started to, to come back. And a year later, I saw her. We did use a little bit of minoxidil for a little while um, because it did stimulate, the, improved her growth, um, her growth phase, of prolonged it and helped uh, recovery come back faster. Uh, but within a year, most of her hair had come back. But it was dramatic, dramatic. And you would have thought she had, was getting chemotherapy. That's how much she was losing her hair. And it was all stress. Um, so it's not, it's, a, it can be a big thing. Um, and I don't think that we really, um, women in general, we are caretakers. Uh, we don't take as good care of ourselves and we need to make time to do that. And, and it's not, um, it's not always easy to do that. Um, somebody asked about supplements. Um, what I can tell you is uh, I'll share our, our supplements have a little bit differently than some of the other hair supplements that are out there because we also include the B vitamins. Uh, like Nutrafol does not include the B vitamins except for biotin, which is a B vitamin. But we also include the B vitamins as well as some of the um, multivitamin and um, some of the proteins that are in there. Um, B vitamins are very important for stress um, because if you're not eating well, you're not getting those B vitamins and we know that the hair will grow. So that's the one thing that we add that, that Nutrafol does not. The other thing we add is a prebiotic, not a probiotic, but a prebiotic. And a prebiotic are supplements that actually help the bacteria in your gut function better to decrease the risk of that leaky gut, which increases inflammation. So those, those are the supplements that, that we recommend here. And I do think it makes a difference. We saw that in small study that we did um, that I, I do think that these women were just deficient. They weren't eating well. They weren't getting all the nutrients. Our, our, as I said, our diet in this country is horrific. Um, I'm not saying I'm perfect with my diet. I try really hard, um, but we all have our weak moments. But um, I think you need, everybody should take a look at their diet. Try and make some changes and, and lean towards more of a, an anti-inflammatory diet. It's very important. And I think that's the end of our questions. 
Um, but again, if somebody, if later on um, you think about something and you want to um, ask us a question, you can email us at info at manytrust.com. I appreciate your patience and interest in joining us tonight. I think this is a very important topic. I don't think we talk about it enough. In my medical training, we hardly ever talk about this. We didn't talk about nutrition. We didn't talk about stress. The medical uh, world is a very stressful world, uh, but we all live in a stressful world. So anything that we can do to minimize that stress um, is, is very important. So thank you for joining us. Um, um, typically, just thinking ahead, yeah, usually in the beginning of the new year, I do what's new, you know, sort of an update and what's new in, in hair loss treatments. I'm probably not going to do that until March because um, going to um, a dermatology conference where there's a lot of discussion on new hair treatments. So at that point, I think we will uh, do sort of an update on, on what's new in, in hair treatments and, and hair loss. So. Again, thank you for joining us and um, hopefully you can join us again in the future. Thank you.